pastoral scene is this ominous uh, foreshadowing of you know, the, the, the real duress uh, that's, that's to come. And that's the part that's the fiction. That's where it stops being autobiography. And, and that phrase that author says, it's steeped in autobiography. It has the flavor of autobiography. It has the, the texture and the tone of autobiography at times. But there's another kind of concoction, if you will, that's, that, that's a foot. Interesting, right, because of course that's what's missing in life. We're not privileged to see our foreshadow right. as we live our lives. Right. Um, but I, I think that's also part of what makes this novel so effective, is that by the time the concentration camp chapter comes around, so many of its elements are familiar, even in a kind of a subconscious way. For instance, there's this episode that takes place in the boarding school, <coughs> which is a sounds like a truly a, a wretched like it's worse than the worst stereotypes of English boarding schools, for sure. Right. And in fact, it sounds, from our perspective now, it sounds kind of like a concentration camp. Yeah. There are a tremendous number of rules about what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. There's a strange ritual, like a roll call in the concentration camp, right. where the students, um, I was said prisoners, the students, yeah, right. have, <laughs> the students have to assemble outside in the mornings and have their fingernails inspected. Right. And this weird focus on hygiene. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, and it's called the box, is, is what the school is referred to because of its you know, architecture. It looks like a big box, but also metaphorically, clearly, there's a kind of imprisonment uh, going on there. Uh, I think in your article you pointed out, Adler called it his first concentration camp. Right. <laughs> uh, so, but again, that brings the question of what is happening for us as readers. You know, Joseph can't see that. While well, he's in, he, he he doesn't like the place. He very much uh, hates it and, and feels uh, sort of repressed there. But the notion of it being a constant, he's he's unable to say, "Oh, this is like the concentration camp that I'm going to end up in in chapter nine. Um, but we can. That's a, that's a place where I think we can start to see that kind of element uh, uh, coming out of it. The other element of too is that Joseph course survives and in a way is remembering. There's two characters that shows the prayer, sort of Dante, like Dante. It's, there's Dante the pilgrim walking through the poem and Dante the poet on the outside writing the poem. There's Joseph Kramer, the little boy, the teenager, the, the young man, and then there's Joseph Kramer, the, the survivor, who is in many ways composing this and then there's one further removed, of course, of Adler uh, being the one who's constructing Joseph so with all this, we know Adler is a Jew from Prague. He names his character with Joseph K. Joseph Kramer. I feel like we can't really right. avoid the ghost of Kafka here. Yeah. No, he. I mean, Adler considered himself uh, a literary descendant of Kafka. You know, one of, you know, of the Prague school of letters, which obviously Kafka is the most central, most important figure of. But there are others, Max Bolton, and uh, 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 other you know, key figures, so that Robert Rizzio has been, in some ways, been linked with that uh, circle at times of, uh, as well. Uh, in The Journey, the other novel that I've translated, uh, the Lustig family, which is deported to a place like Theresienstadt, is, is taken away from a city called Stubart. Well, there is no city called Stubart in, in Czechoslovakia, uh, but Kafka grew up on Stubart Gasa, and, and you can clearly see Akhla Bader. I think what's interesting about that is, in many ways, as we know, Kafka was writing a metaphorical nightmare, which can end up, in many ways, coming true. Um, and Adler is writing about, if you will, the nightmare that he uh, experienced and turning that into literary fiction, um, sort of making it <coughs> untrue in the literary sense. Uh, so he, in, in a way, he's a mirror of Kafka. Uh, in, in that time. I think it would be awesome to talk a little bit about the way he handles the actual concentration camp experience yes. in both of his books. It's very, for lack of a better word, very literary, very stylized, um, and certainly not what we've come to think of as testimonial. Yeah, well, one key element, as you know, is, is that he rarely uses the, the, the uh, regular nomenclature of Holocaust fiction or Holocaust writing on Nazis or. Hitler. Hitler, I mean, Hitler shows up a little bit right. here, but here he's uh, called the Conqueror. Uh, 
is. And that's one thing I found so striking is that he calls the Jews the lost. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and again, that's that bit of remove, that, that bit of artistic remove. Uh, in the journey, he never mentions Theresienstadt or Auschwitz or any place that we would recognize. All the names are made up. Theresienstadt is called Ruhental, which means peaceful valley. Uh, and uh, so there's always this kind of aestheticizing of, of the experience itself, which I think was made it hard uh, for the reception of the novels when they, when they initially came out, it was hard for him to, to find publishers. That's that artistic shaking that, he, that he's trying to 